So this morning, if you're here for the first time, we're so glad that you came to join us at Bethel Church. This is a great place to be. It's where God reigns. God is on the throne at Bethel Church. Amen. We have gifts and talents and abilities that we give to the Lord, but God receives the glory for everything. I want to ask you a question starting this message this morning. Simple question. Who do you think the greatest warrior in the Bible is? Now, don't call out an answer. It's kind of a rhetorical question, but just for, I want you to think about it. Who do you, would you consider, let's see, we have uh, Gideon, a great man of valor, the Bible says, a mighty man of valor. We have uh, Joshua, who fought the battle of Jericho, marching around the cities, never shot a single gun or sh shot an arrow or a spear, but the walls came tumbling down. There was Samson, who killed a thousand Philistines at one time. We have David, who was a mighty general in his own right, and uh, David, who killed Goliath and a lion and a bear in his part time as a kid. Who would you consider the greatest warrior in the Word of God? Well, I've got an idea. I'm going to propose to you this morning that the greatest warrior in the Word of God was Samuel. You say, Samuel, who's that? Why, why him? He's one of those minor characters in the Word of God. Oh, no, he's not. He is a blessed child of God from his birth. And one, what Samuel did through prayer was greater than than any of the other Bible characters of the Old Testament. There, there was something that happened because of his ability to touch God in prayer that, not, that didn't happen for any other warrior in the Old Testament. In 1 Samuel chapter 7, the Bible tells us the, that the nation of Israel has been defeated by Philistines again. They've captured the Ark of the Covenant and the children of God are afraid. They're very afraid and they ask Samuel, Samuel, pray for us, pray for us. And so the scripture says in verse 8, 1 Samuel 7 and verse 8, the children of Israel said to Samuel, do not cease to pray to the Lord for us that he may save us from the Philistines. In verse 9, then Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel and ceased not to pray and the Lord heard him. Do you know we can pray and the Lord won't hear us? You know we can say and not pray that there's a difference between saying something and actually reaching the throne of heaven. The Bible says that Samuel prayed and the Lord heard him. The next verse says, So the Philistines were subdued all the days of Samuel. The Philistines, his enemies, cowered down and never came around again, never attacked the nation of Israel again all the days of Samuel. Can you imagine what spiritual warfare we're talking about where he, a person doesn't shoot a single weapon or attack anybody, doesn't kill anybody, and yet his enemies are subdued the rest of his life. You know what? As a child of God, we have already won the victory over the enemy, over Satan, the devil, our enemy, and we have spiritual victory through Jesus Christ. He is subdued all the days of our life as we walk with the Lord. It was prophesied in the book of Genesis that the snake's head would be bruised by the Son of God. And that happened when Jesus died on the cross. He gave us that same victory. And today, you and I can enjoy the same kind of victory that Samuel has. Oh, there may be times when, when uh, trials may come and difficulties may arise and temptations could occur. But we have the victory through Jesus Christ. I saw a sign some time ago that said, War on the floor and it showed a, a man prostrate on his knees and his hands reached out in front of him praying. You know, we're in a spiritual warfare time. Pastors talked about this and it's a time when the real battle is not with weapons, carnal weapons, but are with spiritual weapons. They are with a weapon of prayer. The fight is actually on our knees. I remember years ago, and this is even actually before I was married, we've been married 40 Three and a half years, I think. 44 in May. And it was just, I, I, I didn't want to put her on the spot, but 1976. Whew. So it'll be 43 in May. I was right. All right. Pretty good quick math there. Actually, I rehearsed that before I came out here. Um, but I remember driving in my hometown, and as I was driving past the hospital, I noticed a couple of ambulances in there, nothing unusual, delivering patients to the hospital in the ER uh, area, doorway. But as I drove past the hospital, another ambulance passed me on the way. A few moments later, another ambulance passed me on the way, and I thought, what 
tragedy is going on that all these ambulances are racing to the hospital with patients. I turned around and went back to the hospital and watched them as they came in one after another and I was overtaken with anxiety. Now I was a new Christian at this time. I was, bo I was born again in 75. This was probably during that year or early 76. And um, I drove away from the hospital feeling a heaviness in my heart and wondering what disaster had taken place, what great calamity had taken place. And as I drove away from the hospital, another ambulance drove past me, lights and siren on in its way to the hospital, and then another one came by and think, and you're wondering what in the world is going on. I pulled over and I just prayed. What else can you do if you're not a first responder but just pray in a time of tragedy? Well, after a short while of prayer, I turned on the radio and found out that they were doing a disaster drill in town and Boy Scouts had volunteered to be injured patients and I was a little bit angry at first. I thought, are you kidding me? Here I am praying for a bunch of volunteers, fake patients. But then as I thought about it longer, I thought, you know what? It was a disaster drill, right? What do you do in a time of disaster? The solution for us as believers is to pray is to seek God and say, Lord, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what this, this disaster is. I don't know what's happening in my life right now. And we've all experienced those times, whether it be illness or financial difficulty or relationships in our life where it just seems like a personal disaster. And it's that time when it's a drill that you can practice and say, you know what? That's the time I need to seek the Lord in prayer. Paul said, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith and he didn't kill a single person after he was a Christian. He killed people as a Roman soldier before he was saved, but after he was saved, he said, I have fought a good fight and I've kept the faith. Therefore, there's laid up for me a, a crown of righteousness in heaven. But what I find interesting is he fought the good fight and won the race and never was in a fist fight or a battle with someone else. The battle he was talking about was praying. Paul said this, pray without ceasing pray continuously in the old testament jehoshaphat king jehoshaphat the children of israel were under a battle i think at this time with the amalekites and the lord spoke to him and said the battle is not yours but it is mine stand back and see the salvation of your lord and so jehoshaphat appointed singers and musicians to stand before israel and they proclaimed a fast and they prayed and they worshiped god and when the enemy came to destroy them, their enemy ended up killing each other and defeating themselves. There is an advocate that we have with God that is greater than any that we could ever imagine. I want to talk to you this morning about the prevailing power of prayer in our life. Prayer is without ceasing. It's continuing. It's like when you, when you gave your heart to the Lord, you started a relationship with God that never ends. Prayer is not an event or an, an activity. It's not something that we do, well, from 8 to 8.15, I'm going to pray. From 5 to 6.30, I'm going to have prayer time. And, and it's okay to do that. It's okay to have organized, structured, corporate prayer. And you can have a very disciplined life and exercise at a certain time and pray at a certain time. But prayer is more than talking. Prayer is more than, than an activity. Prayer is more than just asking and thanking God for things. Prayer is a personal intimate relationship with God. Prayer is to the Christian what air is to us as human beings. It's where we live. We should be continually in a state of prayer in our lives. That way when those difficult times come, we are ready and we are prepared. There's nothing that can come against us. You see, the world values things like money, education, talent, technology, all these kinds of razzle-dazzle things. And I've stood pretty strongly in my life, well-educated and successful in, in my professional life, and I found myself depending more upon me than on God. And when spiritual warfares came, I was not prepared because my faith was in me, not in him. A praying Christian is the greatest resource that the church has. There is nothing more powerful than a person who prays. Nothing. That's why Teresa kind of scares me sometimes. <laughs> My wife scares me that way too because she's a prayer. I can pray. 
I know how to pray, but I'm not very good at it. Really, is it okay if we have transparency here? There's power in prayer. And there seems to be some people that have been given a gift of prayer and have the ability to intercede and spend time travailing. I go through my list of, okay, I prayed for my five things on my list. Now what? It's, I've been praying for two minutes. So I start over again. I say, well, Lord, you know I love you, and I prayed for everything, but there, there are times when I've been lost in the presence of God, but it doesn't come naturally. It's something that I have to work at. And for some people, it just seems to come more naturally for them. Prayer is to the church what money is to the businessman. It is our investment. It is our equity. It is our seed faith. We are in spiritual warfare. And the Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So you can't study your way to victory. You can't educate your way to victory. You can't practice your way to victory. Victory comes when we have a relationship with Almighty God and we place Him where He belongs on the throne of our heart. God is in control. You know, the Bible says the kingdom of God is within us. And real prayer is when we place God on the throne of our heart and we have a relationship with Him that never gives up that never surrenders. My, my wife used to tell me, because it's kind of like a marriage, our relationship with God. It should be continuous. My wife, and so we should be thinking about the Lord at all times. He should be just a moment's breath away. He inhabits the praises of his people. So we should have a spirit of praise and worship in our hearts all the time. And my wife would say when I'd come home from work, so did you think about me today? And I knew I couldn't lie to her said, honey, I was so busy. I didn't think about you. And year, years ago, I did something. I always keep cards in my pocket, my list of things to do. And I, I know I've got technology that I could write things down and I've tried the technology, but I'm still an old school guy. I carry a pen in my pocket and index cards in my, in my pocket as well. And then I saw every day I'd make my to-do list for that day. And I started putting my wife at the top of the list. I love my wife or I love my wife or thinking about my wife. And I'd write it different ways. And as I got through my day and I did things and I'd check off the things I did, I never checked that one off because I never accomplished. I never got done doing it. If I checked it off, I wouldn't look at it anymore. And I did this for many years when I was a school principal and I worked full time. And I'd come home from work and she'd say, did you think about me today? And I said, look, honey, I've been thinking about you all day. I've looked at these cards probably 20 times, getting my jobs and my projects to do during the day. And every time I look at that card, I know that I'm never done thinking about you. Ah, oh. well, it helps. It helps, you know. Every little thing, thing helps. <laughs> Believe it, Keith. <laughs> I'm, I'm setting a higher standard for you, brother. So, what is prayer? You know, we talk about prayer. We we say. I've heard people say, "Well, I'm praying for you." And they're not even Christians. They're not even believers. It's just kind of an overused expression. If someone's having a difficult time, well, my thoughts and prayers are with you. Listen, thoughts are not prayers. Thinking about your situation is not prayer. Saying something about, I sure feel bad for them. It sure must be tough. If you say it or if you think it, that is not prayer. Prayer is more than that. Prayer breaks us. It allows us to live in the will of God every moment of our life. And that's the kind of relationship that God wants to have for us. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a contrite heart. That's where we want to be. It's not about thinking. It's not about saying certain things. It's that relationship with God. And when we have that, when we have that, we're in a place where we can call upon the Lord anytime. You know, you're driving down the highway and something happens in front of you and all of a sudden you realize, Jesus! Well, if Jesus is far from you, you may not even think to react with those words. My wife does. I mean, Jesus is on the forefront of her mind and her heart all the time. And when she calls out the Lord, it's like, whoa, what happened? What did I miss? And she says, it's your driving. You're driving me crazy. She... <laughs> She's a professional driver, so she knows how to do that stuff. And I say, honey, why don't you drive? She says, no, I want you to drive. But you're going to pick on me the whole time if I'm driving. She's over there kind of tense and in a mode of prayer. It's like, and I'm not even a bad driver, but, you know, 
at least she thinks I am, but I don't think so. <laughs> so I have to tell you, my life changed 17 years ago. In 2002, I was a principal in Sandusky, Ohio. I'd learned in my, in my skill and trade to depend upon myself. I was well-educated, highly skilled. I could run an elementary school building. That was my job. I'd done it a few places before. I was in Sandusky running a building that was a very difficult and challenging population. There were staff issues, student issues. The community was a mess. In the area that we lived in, it was the highest poverty area in Sandusky, 94% free and reduced lunches. We had so many free lunches that the school district decided to just give them all a free lunch because we were only collecting money out of one out of 20 students much like inner city Toledo. But that's not the point of the story. It was a difficult job and the building was running well and everything was under control until God decided to give me a lesson in humility. You see, I had come to a place in my walk with the Lord where I didn't even request prayer. Oh, I've got it. I can take care of it. Don't worry about me. People say, Is there, are there any prayer requests? I never had a prayer request. Even if there was something bothering me, I was blessed to be healthy. I didn't get sick often. I mean, almost never. And uh, I would pray for other people and, you know, I could intercede for them. But if I had a need, ah, I'll take care of it. I don't need you, God. I didn't say that, but that was kind of my attitude. I became more and more self-reliant and I know that I'm not alone. Some of you are in that same place or you've been in that place in your life. It's not a very healthy spiritual place to be. And yet that's where I was. And hey, the building was running well. I was dealing with problems and situations all day long. And when you're a school principal, decision making is like shooting a machine gun. It's like rapid fire. You know, there's a student problem, a parent problem, a teacher problem, and, and there's just issues, uh, processes and operations in the building. And it happened all day long. And I was pretty good at doing that. And so I felt good about what I was doing until I got sick. And I was one of those guys, and you, men, you can relate to this. I told my wife, you're never going to take me to the hospital. The only way I'm going to the hospital is in an ambulance unconscious because I don't need doctors in hospitals either. I got this. I'll take care of myself. And it was kind of a cocky, arrogant attitude, and I don't think that I came across that way, but internally that's what I, I kind of felt and, and thought myself. Well, I got sick really bad on a Saturday, Stomach problems, really hard, like a big fist, like a giant softball in my stomach. It hurt, and I got through the day thinking, yeah, this will pass, like most things. It'll go away, it's just another, another little thing. Sunday morning came, and I was barely able to stand straight up and walk. I was in such pain, but I went to church, and for the first time, I looked for the prayer warriors in our church. We had a group of women and men who met regularly and prayed. They were our intercessors. And I sought them out after church. I said, could you guys pray for me? Because I'm not feeling real good, and I think I need prayer. Now, you have to understand, that was a major break in my life. For the guy who didn't need prayer, who had never even, had never even raised his hand for a prayer request, I'm seeking out the prayer warriors, someone who knows how to get a hold of God, because I've kind of wandered. I mean, I was still saved, but I wandered away from God. I wasn't so close to God that I, I knew to just fall on my knees and pray to God myself. And after service, I told my wife what I thought I would never tell her. Take me to the hospital. It was tough. And when I got to the hospital, it took them just a short while in the emergency room to realize that I was very sick. I had diverticulitis, which in and of itself can be annoying. It's an inflammation of the colon, but mine had burst which would be like a ruptured appendix. The infection was spreading. The infection was spreading throughout my, my core, my stomach. And what I was feeling was this huge amount of infection that was in my life, in my body. And the doctor said, well, you're gonna have to stay in the hospital for a while. We're gonna have to do surgery. And I started crying. I was, excuse me. I wasn't crying because I was sick. I was crying because I had a building to run. I had a job to do. There's things to do. I've got people that are depending on me tomorrow morning. I don't have time for this. And too bad, so sad, that's the way it is. Well, I found out how quickly I could be replaced. I called the superintendent. 
He said, don't worry, I've got a retired principal that can fill in for you tomorrow morning. I thought, really, that easy? <laughs> I'm irreplaceable, I thought, and here it is. He makes one phone call and someone covers my job for the next two weeks, actually for about five or six weeks. I spent the next 13 days in the hospital, flat on my back with both arms stretched out. One had antibiotics in it. The other one was my lunch, breakfast, and dinner, going through an IV, and I was bedfast with nothing to do. There was nothing that I could do. My intelligence, my skills, my talent meant nothing. I was on the verge of death, and there was nothing that I could do except Talk about God placing you in a place where it's like, and now what are you going to do? And I prayed, and everyone that came to see me, and lots of people came from the church and from the school, every person that came to see me, I said, pray for me before you go. And some of them weren't really prayers. They'd look at me kind of awkwardly like, well, gee, I've never prayed for anyone before. I said, just pray for me. Okay, the Lord... You know, our Father which art in heaven, they didn't really know prayer. Forgive us of trespassing, you know, the Lord's Prayer. One, I was in a, by, uh, a semi-private room, so there was a patient in the bedroom, in the room, in the bed next to me. And actually, many people came and went, you know, 13 days in the hospital, that doesn't happen very often. You've got to be pretty sick and full of infection uh, in order to spend that many days, because they try to kick you out as soon as possible. Then I spent a few weeks recovering at home. But there was a man in the bed next to me, one of the patients that were there, of the several that came and went while I was in the hospital. And a priest came, went over and met with him, and uh, they did some praying over there. And as the priest is leaving, I said, hey, hey, sir, I'll take some of that. <laughs> and the priest prayed for me as well. So, hey, I'll take it. He's a believer. I'm taking the prayers, all right? Give me a few of our fathers. Send them my way. I'll take those any day. Well, what I've discovered in my life that I hope helps some of you today that may be in the same place that I was or you can remember where you were when you were in that situation. I remembered what Jesus said, I can do nothing without my Father and I'm certainly not the Son of God. Jesus was also the Son of Man and he talked about in his humanity that he could do nothing without God. Nothing. All of the miracles, the wonderful things that he did, all the great uh, manifestations and, and salvations that were taking place in the life of Christ, and yet nothing happened without God. He understood that. I had to learn that lesson. And I had already been saved for over 20 years. I wasn't a new Christian anymore. I was just a self-sufficient, independent self-made person. I just felt like I had it all and I was in charge and it was my responsibility. Well, what I learned was that if you want God to move, you can't just wait. You've got to pray. God is waiting for us to humble ourselves and pray. Remember the, the scripture, 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. It's very meaningful to this experience at Ontario School. If my people, which are called by my name, that included me, will humble themselves and pray. Because if you don't humble yourself in prayer, you may be saying and not praying. If you're just going through the routine, the, rec the recitation, you're just making sounds, which is what my prayers often were. I was saying things, but I really wasn't even thinking with my heart and my spirit what was happening. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. I didn't remember that scripture at that time, but that, that describes exactly where I was and what I was going through. You see, what I learned from all of that was a couple of things. Number one, I learned that I can do nothing without God. Whatever talents and gifts I have are nothing if the Lord's not in it. And we, we, can, we can work real hard and become better singers and more talented, and we can study real hard and be better teachers, 
But it's all in vain if it's not for God. And when God is in it, everything matters. Everything is valued and important and blessed by Him. I was fortunate in my life to not be sick before that time. I'd never been in the hospital uh, since, well, there was one time in high school with a broken leg, but I'd never been in the hospital since birth until I was whatever, however old I was 17 years ago. I can't do that fast math, okay? 40-something years old. And uh, I learned that I can do nothing without God. That God is able to do according, exceeding and abundantly, but according to the power that works in us. And if we don't use the power of God that's in us, we're on our own. God loves us. He's waiting for us. He's waiting for us to pray from our heart and break down and be broken and contrite before him and say, Lord, God, humbly, I pray, I need you. And when we come to that desperate place in our life, you know, much of my, my prayers was giving God advice. Well, God, did you know so-and-so sick? I think we could, you know, I know you're the healer and you can heal him. I wasn't praying broken and contrite. I was, break, I was praying in arrogance. And my prayers were discolored with my own personal ambitions. Instead of saying, Lord, what do you want? My prayer was, Lord, this is what I want. Will you bless it? Be careful what you're doing. Now, I know that the Lord is speaking through me to some of you this morning specifically, and God's addressing this in your hearts because he did to me. So this is my confession becomes your lesson. Don't be on your back with both arms and IVs knowing that there's nothing else that you can do but pray to realize what I found out for myself. As a believer, as someone that God loves, he still has his ways and God's ways are above our ways. If we're waiting for God, I would suggest that you begin praying to God, beckoning his presence in your life. I also learned this. Pray first. You see, what I did in my life before was get on with my day, man. I got to get to work. That place doesn't run without me. <laughs> man, that was a tough lesson. I got to get there and set things up and organize and get ready. And I was there, you know, two hours before the teachers or students ever wrote, showed up. And after they all went home, I was still the last one to leave the building doing all the paperwork and things that you can't do when there are people in the building. I called it people and paper. And when they were in the building, it was people time. And when they all left, there was a stack of papers and phone calls that I had to return and do all the paper time. But what I found that I needed to do in my life and what the Lord gave me was this. Pray first. Pray every morning. And, and this is a practice that I did for the rest of my, my professional career. Except for my wife, I spoke with no one before I spoke to the Lord every single day. Speak to God first before you speak to any person you would be mad. You'd be amazed at how differently your days are. What I did was, I'd get into the midst of my day, and halfway through, I'm dealing with some huge crisis, and I'd say, "Oh Lord, help me." Well, why didn't I pray first? And maybe the crisis could have been avoided. Maybe I would have had the wisdom and the sense and the will and the direction of God in my daily activities instead of just depending upon me. And so. When I'd get in my car in the morning, after this, after I recovered, you know, weeks later and went back to work, I would leave the radio off in the morning. My van and my car became my prayer room. No music. I don't need to listen to the news again this morning. I just listened to it before I laid my head on the pillow at nighttime. I don't need to read the newspaper and fill my head with all this junk first thing in the morning. And this works for me. It may work for you. God first. Speak first to God before speaking to any person. So I would spend my, my 10 minute ride to work speaking to the Lord. And my 10 minutes ended up being a half an hour because I would drive slow. Instead of racing to work, to race to my job, to race through the day and get things done and check everything off my list that had to get done, I was such a busy person that I was just going around circles. Been there? And I'd spend that time with the Lord and pray, and I'd find myself slowing down, going around the block, pulling into the parking lot and just sitting in my vehicle, 
I didn't have the music. I didn't want, now, for some of you, music would be a good background. But for music, I, I find music annoying. And so, at least when I'm in, in that state, in a state of prayer. And so I would just talk to the Lord and pray. And, you know, pray and worship. And sometimes I would sing not sing from music on the radio, but sing old hymns, songs like Just a Closer Walk with Thee or I'm learning to lean on the everlasting arms of Jesus. Learning to lean. I, I'll forget the words if I sing it, unless I sing it. I don't, I don't want to sing it. You, you don't want me to sing it, all right? <laughs> Keith, there you are laughing again. <clears throat> yeah, he knows. He gets a pass. <clears throat> I'd send him in the front, to the front next to the teacher, but I try to, students like him, I'd always say, you need to go sit in the seat in the back of the room. Anyway, there were, um, I always took my hymnal with me to work. I had my Bible and my hymnal with me all the time. And I, for me, praying, it, praying is still difficult for me. It's challenging. Now, I can sing, and the words in that song became my prayers. Learning to lean close to you, Lord. I want to draw closer to you. I found the words in the song were able to be the thong, the thoughts that were in my heart. And for me, that worked. And so the songbook, the hymnal, I know the old classic hymnal, it became part of my prayer life. And I did that every morning on my way to work. And it changed my life immensely. I became someone who wept before before really breaking down and having that experience, I didn't cry. I mean, I probably could have, but I don't remember crying in my young adult life and my early professional life at all. I just, that was, you know, the emotions were a distraction. And yet, and yet I knew the Lord and, I, and I'm sure I was saved. I, I could teach a good lesson at church and preach a good message at church, but it wasn't the same. And because God broke my spirit and was molding me into a different person, I found myself like this morning kind of choking up at times, being tender, you know, tender hearted and teary eyed. One of the things that impressed me so much about Bethel Church when my wife and I started coming here was within the first three months we had seen Pastor Ted, Pastor Kevin, and Pastor Ken all weep in the presence of the Lord. That's powerful. People that are broken. You know a lot about a, a person's spirit and their relationship with God when they're not afraid to, as they're talking, get a little choked up in the presence of the God because it is not us. The person that stands behind this sacred desk and on this platform and holds the microphone on Sunday morning has a tremendous responsibility. And we realize that without God, we are nothing. Amen. Amen. So, you know, I, I wasn't great at praying, but I could study. So I decided to go through the Old Testament and find examples where somebody prayed and God moved. Just a single person prayed. Not, not the whole nation of Israel prayed, but just single people. Elijah prayed and fire fell from heaven. Did you know that? You know that because that's famous. Elijah was an important person. Isaiah prayed and 185,000 of his enemies were instantly destroyed. Hezekiah prayed on his deathbed and God prolonged his life for 15 more years. I'm talking about people alone. What one person who breaks their heart and spirit and prays sincerely to God can do. What can one person do that will sincerely pray and touch heaven with their prayers? Joshua prayed, and the sun stood still. Is that possible? Not physically, not scientifically, but the one that created the earth can do whatever he chooses. And the prayers of Joshua caused the sun to stand still. It wasn't like seven or eight minutes. Does it say in the Bible how long it stood still? Maybe not. Maybe I read someplace that it was calculated in a few moments. I'm not, I'm not sure about that. I didn't dig him up, but I, I remembered it. Daniel prayed and refused to quit praying, and he was delivered from the lion's den. Moses prayed, and he saw the glory of God. It shone so brightly on his face that he had to cover his face with a veil in the presence of his friends. Jonah prayed, and he was forgiven, and Nineveh was spared. These people prayed alone. One person can pray. You know, we often go through it at the altar time, and we may have altar time today, and we pray, and we gather around, and we anoint with oil, and we lay hands on. But I'm telling you that you by yourself hold the power of Almighty God in the voice of your prayer. 
You, you know, you can call the pastor for prayer and you can call the prayer chain for prayer and you can come to special prayer meetings, but we need to realize, and that, I, that was something that I never really understood until 2002 in my life, that the power of prayer is in the person that sits or kneels or lays prostrate before God and humbly prays to God and seeks his face. And any of us can be that person. David prayed and he was protected from Saul's wrath. Hannah prayed because she was childless. And Samuel was born, a great man of God. Esther prayed and Israel was set free. Samuel prayed and the Philistines were subdued for the rest of his life. Listen, these are not exceptions. This is the rule, my friends. Every great powerful move of God and the word of God was preceded by prevailing prayer. Someone touched heaven with prayer and God moved. I said, well, what about the New Testament? Because there's lots of miraculous events in the Old Testament. So what about the New Testament, the book of Acts? So, you know, I'm the studier, right? That's what I do naturally and easily. And I love to analyze and break down. So I'm going to go to the book of Acts. You know, God moved in a powerful way and all these miracles were taking place and people were being filled with the Holy Spirit and saved Where's the prayer there? Well, here's a few examples. Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, they were all in one mind and one accord, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven, and it filled all the house, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Back up a few verses. Acts 1.14 says, They all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. You see, the day of Pentecost was preceded by 10 days of, of prayer, waiting on the Lord. And so many times we pray for something. See, I prayed about it. Par parents would tell me, would, would make a suggestion to parents about, well, why don't you do this? Well, I tried that. It didn't work. Well, try it a hundred more times. I told my child to stop doing something, and he, he didn't stop. How many times is a parent going to repeat themselves until they finally smack their hand a little bit or try some other punitive consequences? We don't just do something once and expect it to be happening instantly. It could happen that way. God could answer on the first breath of our voice. But the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much. And on the day of Pentecost, it was followed by many days of prayer. Acts chapter 4, you don't have to go much farther. The place was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and the word of God was spoken with boldness. Isn't that the kind of church that we want? A place where the presence of God is so powerful that the word is spoken with boldness, and the place is shaken in the power of God? We'll back up a few verses and find out what they were doing first. They lifted up their voices to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God. And when they prayed, the place was shaken. That's in context, right? You know, we, we often want the event. We want the Azusa Street. We want the Brownsville. We want the Toronto Blessing. We want these great moves of God. We just want a simple miracle in our life. And we fail to forget or fail to remember that these things all were preceded by a brokenness and a humility of prayer. Not just saying, but praying. Hallelujah. Chapter 6, Acts. The number of disciples multiplied. Many priests even joined the faith. You know, those same priests that crucified Christ, those Jewish leaders that were out to kill him and crucify him, in the book of Acts, they came to the Lord. They became the first Messianic Jews. They surrendered their life and became Christians. Well, we want to see that. We want to see Perrysburg for Jesus. Use me, O Lord. Well, what the Bible says was in three verses before the multitude grew and the priests were converted, we will give ourselves continually to prayer. It's there. Chapter 10. While Peter yet spoke these words, the Holy Spirit fell. And all of those that heard the word were filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other tongues. They were baptized by Peter. So what a move of God in the house of Cornelius. Cornelius and his whole house was saved. They were filled with the, with the presence of God and were baptized. They were saved and delivered that very moment. But you go back to the beginning of Acts chapter 10 and you'll find out that Cornelius was a devout man who feared God and who prayed always. Prayer preceded the move on his life. 
And we can't forget the most important event in human history. And that's not a question. It's an answer that we should all know was when Jesus gave his life on the cross. And don't forget that just a few hours before he died on the cross, he prayed in agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. He prayed before God used him. And if God is going to use you and if God is going to move in your life, you're going to have to agonize in prayer. Not just say pray, but humbly pray and seek the face of God. And he will hear from heaven and heal your situation. But it takes devotion. It takes, it takes, it takes sincerity. It takes intimacy with God. It's not casual. And sometimes it's gradual and sometimes it's instant. But it's powerful. It's a powerful move of God. People in our modern day, Spurgeon, John Wesley, they were men that prayed. Matter of fact, Spurgeon, how are we doing on time? We're, oh, we're, oh gosh, we're, we're doing great on time. I got another hour. I'm winding down. We're, we're over the hump in my notes anyway. Spurgeon on Monday night, Spurgeon was a, pre, a preacher in Great Britain. Charles Spurgeon, great writer, wrote hundreds and hundreds of books. I can't imagine anyone being such a prolific writer. But he was known for his great spiritual moves of God. And he was Baptist, but God moved powerfully in his services. And on Monday night, he would have a men's prayer meeting with 1,200 men. Over 1,000 men would gather on Monday night and have prayer. That's why they had church on Sunday. That was what sustained them. And in their big, in their big room, their big like fellowship hall, auditor, uh, like gymnasium type setting that they had, social room, they would pray. And he describes how they would pray walking in a circle. Imagine, imagine this thousand men walking in a circle in unison, walking and praying. And they would pray for an hour or two every Monday night. And then they would disperse. And, and uh, that's how God moved in that church. I went to a church in Austin, Texas several years ago, and it was like this. They didn't have 1,000 men, but they had, it was a large church in Austin, Texas. They had probably a church of 1,000 altogether. And before service, for about a half an hour before service, the women went someplace and prayed. I'm not sure where, but the men all gathered in a special fellowship hall, probably bigger than the one that we have, maybe as big as this room, and they prayed in that same kind of circle. Now, it's interesting that they would do that because I, I later found out that Spurgeon, that was what his men did, was pray as they were walking in a circle. And, you know, the more intense you pray, the faster you walk. I mean, they're kind of passing each other and some are lapping others. And, and I was in this prayer circle. I got in the circle. And, man, you know, I'm a little short, chubby guy. So keeping up with these guys and, and their prayer life, they were moving. And it was flowing. And I went around there about 10 laps. And I thought, man, whew. I need to pull over here and take a pit stop, you know? And I noticed the middle of the circle was empty. I thought, oh, cool, that's a great place to go. So I pulled off into the center thinking I'm going to take a little prayer stop and catch my breath, right? Well, what I didn't know was that's where you go when you need prayer. Yeah. Instantly, you know, 20, 30, 40 hands, boom, 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 boom. I'm hit from all sides. It wasn't a break for me. I said, I'm getting back in the circle and pray some more, you know? It was amazing, but... That's what they did. They prayed. They prayed. Billy Graham, you, you know him by preaching in Coliseums where there was, you know, like Ohio State Coliseum, but the place is full, 100,000, 50,000 are gathered together. But originally, he started out in the Canvas Cathedral with a huge circus tent. And they would take this circus tent on semis in pieces, and they would assemble it in a, Colise in a, in a big open field, a fairgrounds or someplace, and they would have church every night in the Canvas Cathedral. And about, I've read that about 6,000 people could fit into this massive circus tent structure. And Cliff Barrows describes what happened and the way it went in, in his writings. I went to the Billy Graham Museum in North Carolina. Maybe it's South Carolina. It's right on the border. South, what is it, North? North Carolina, I think. Where the barn is there with his, it's in the shape of a cross in the front of the barn and it, and Billy Graham and his wife are both now buried there. When I was there, he was still living. Anyway, that was a great spiritual experience to go there and visit that, that place and read about 
the evangelism of his life and his ministry. But Cliff Barrows, who was his worship leader, tells not just about the big tent, but he tells about the little tent, which was next to the big tent. Because it was in the little tent that people prayed before and during every service. He said the real work of God took place not in the big tent, but in the little tent before anyone ever arrived. They had a group of people that would gather there and worship and pray and seek the face of God. And when those thousands of people would gather in, people were saved and healed and delivered every night in those sessions. We don't talk a lot about it, but you know, we have prayer ministry here. We have a prayer room here. We have prayer times, prayer nights that are here. And many people come, but many people don't come. And maybe you pray on your own. I would encourage you from, from and one of the catapults that I want to have from this message is that you'll understand the importance of prayer and incorporate it more into your life. Don't wait for disaster and then say, Lord, God, help me. I'm in misery. I'm in quicksand. I'm sinking. I'm going to die, Lord. Why do we have to get to that place in our life before we realize and recognize who God is and what God can do for us? Billy Graham was 92 years old when, uh, a few years ago, I don't know if he was 93 or 94 when he passed away last year in 2018. But this is what he said when he was 92 years old in an interview on television that I saw. They asked him what he wished that they would have done differently. And Billy Graham said, I wish I would have spent more time. Billy Graham reached hundreds of thousands, if not a million people in his life. And yet he wished he would have spent more time praying and reading his Bible. You know what? Leonard Ravenhill, Leonard Ravenhill was one of my favorite authors. If you want to get fired up for Jesus, read some Leonard Ravenhill books. Why Revival Terries was my first one, and I've read several more since then. They're powerful, inspirational words like, um, here are some quotes from his book on prayer. What we need, and you have to say it with a raspy preaching voice because he was an evangelist. What we need is more agonizing and less organizing, more passion and less fashion, more intercessors and less entertainers. More pray. Now, see, if I said this to you, you'd feel bad and I would be judgmental. But Leonard Ravenhill said this. I'm not saying this, all right? More prayers and less players. We need not to be seen by men, but to be heard by God. Wow. Max Lucado said the most important word in prayer is the first word, Lord. Anything that you say after that is going to be less important. The most important word that we pray in prayer is the first word, our Father, or God, or Jesus, or Lord. Mother Teresa said, praying is not asking. It's putting one's life in the hands of a merciful God. Hallelujah. Brother Ted, could you, could you come? Maybe come and begin... I want to close with talking a little bit about, another, I have another question for you. Actually, I to open with a question, and I'm going to close with a question. You know the story of Elijah in the Old Testament. He was caught up by a chariot of fire into heaven and was taken out. And as he, as he was taken away, his mantle, his coat fell to earth, and Elijah captured it. Elijah was given a special promise, a special privilege. As Elijah was getting ready to go and was going to be taken by the Lord, he knew that. He was trying to shake Elisha from him. He said, Elisha, you stay here. I've been called by the Lord to go to Bethel. And Elisha says, where you go, I'm going, man. And so he looked around, and there's still Elisha standing at his side. And so a, few, uh, a short time later, Elijah says, well, Elisha, the Lord has called me to Jericho, and you need to stay here because I'm going to Jericho. The Lord's calling me there. I'm not really sure the purpose of all that. I haven't dissected it and analyzed it. But Elisha said, well, where you go, I'm going. And he did it a third time. And at the third city, which I think was Jordan, it was Bethel, Jericho, and then I think Jordan was the last place. And finally, Elijah looked around, and there was Elisha still waiting, not leaving him. And he said, wherever you go, I'm here. And he said, man, I'm going to bless you today. What, what is it that you want from me? And Elisha says, I want a double portion from God of what you have. I want a double portion. 
And Elijah said, man, in his own words, not, not what I'm saying. Man, that, you're asking for a lot. And in just a moment of time, Elijah was taken up and his mantle fell and Elisha picked it up. Elisha took the mantle and previously to this, Elijah smote the river with his coat and the river, the, and the river parted. And so Elisha was testing the power of God and he took the mantle that Elijah had given him and he ran over and he smote the river with the mantle and the waters parted for Elisha. And he, he said as he hit the water, he said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And Elijah was with God and the power of God continued with Elisha. The question that Elisha asked was where is is the God of Elijah. But I'm going to ask a different question this morning. Where are the Elijahs of God? Not where's the God of Elijah. We know where God's at. God is creator, father, maker, healer, savior. He is all and in all. He's everywhere and can do all things omnipresent and omnipotent. God is God. We know God and his power my question is not, where's the God of Elijah, but where are our Elijahs, people that will pray, that will seek God? Do you realize that Elijah was a special chosen vessel, and when Elijah prayed, a child was raised from the dead? That when Elijah prayed, fire fell from heaven and consumed the sacrifice? That when Elijah prayed, it stopped raining? And when Elijah prayed, it started raining again? He had a special anointing on his life. And that anointing this morning is something that God wants to give to each of us. Would you stand with me right now? God has something in store for every one of us. We're different, you know. We're, we have different talents and different skills. And we have different strengths that we use for God. Some are singers and musicians and teachers and prayers. We're not all the same. But yet we're all human. I think of that song, I thought it was, maybe is it a country song? I'm only human, I'm just a man. I don't know if it's a Christian song or a country song. It sounds kind of like a country song. I'm only human, I'm just a man. That's how I feel. I feel pretty low. In, my, in myself, I don't, I now realize that I'm able to do very little. But I have learned in my walk with God, the 10 most powerful words in the scriptures. Ten most powerful words in the Word of God. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. To God be the glory. I'm going to open this altar just for everyone. Anyone who wants to come, if you want special prayer, if you just want to come and worship and pray, I'd like to encourage you to do so. They're going to sing another song for us and we're going to worship the Lord for a moment. And let's pray. If you have not been in prayer and that's been difficult for you, listen, you don't need someone to pray for you. You need to pray for yourself. God is able to use you. Your words are powerful. But you first must realize that God is on the throne of your heart. Humble yourself and pray. And then you won't have to depend on calling or waiting for someone else. Not that th those are good things. We all lift up and encourage one another. But I encourage you this morning to pray first on your own. Would you come join with me? Let's, let's let these guys worship.